fundamentals of rotational motion in this chapter. The first concept is that of angular velocity. So when you have an object that is rotating in the counterclockwise direction, for example, and if it starts from a point at this, at this position and moves to another point, you can see that the radius completes an angle delta theta in a certain time. So the angular velocity is defined as that angle divided by the time. And its unit is radians per second. And angular velocity is related to linear velocity by this formula. Angular velocity is equal to linear velocity by radius, which can also be arranged this way. Now this means that if you look at two points, let's say one at the, at the edge of the disk and the other somewhere at the center of the disk, at the middle of the disk I mean, not at the center. So the radius of the point C is smaller than the radius of A. But yet both will have the same angular velocity. So it's important to know that at every point on this rotating disk, the angular velocity is the same, but the linear velocity depends on the radius. The further away it is from the center, the bigger the linear velocity. So that's why I'm writing if the radius A is greater than the radius C, then velocity of that point A is greater than the velocity of the point C. Once again, the angular velocities are equal, but the linear velocities are not the same and depends on the radius. If the disk is speeding up, then at every point there is going to be a linear acceleration. And this linear acceleration is also called tangential acceleration. So imagine that the disk starts spinning slowly and then increases its speed, then at every point it has a linear acceleration. It is also to be understood that a linear motion is connected to rotational motion. As you can see, when this motorcycle is accelerating linearly, the tires start rotating faster too. That means for linear acceleration, there is a corresponding angular acceleration. Angular acceleration is going to be the change in the angular velocity, while linear acceleration is going to be the change in the linear velocity. And these two quantities are related by this formula. So the linear acceleration is radius multiplied by angular acceleration. Alpha is the symbol for angular acceleration. Angular acceleration is defined as the change in angular velocity divided by time. Change in angular velocity divided by the time. And therefore the unit is radians per second squared. This slide shows the, the relationship between the quantities in linear motion and rotational motion. For example, x is displacement, linear displacement. Theta is angular displacement. V is linear velocity. And omega is angular velocity. A is linear acceleration. Alpha is angular acceleration. And that is well illustrated by looking at this fishing reel. As the fishing line is pulled out, that's linear motion, the motion of the fishing line. But then the reel begins to spin, which is rotational motion. So that shows you that they are connected. 
And here again are the corresponding terms in linear motion and rotational motion. X corresponds to theta, V corresponds to omega, and AT corresponds to alpha. And similarly, we can connect many of the equations in linear motion with the corresponding ones in rotational motion. Delta X is displacement. Angular displacement is delta omega, uh, delta theta, I mean. Velocity, and then you have angular velocity, omega. And uh, know that velocity is delta x by delta t, angular velocity is delta theta by delta t. And that's the relation between the two. We looked at this, that is linear acceleration, delta v by delta t. Angular acceleration, alpha, is delta omega by delta t. And that is the relation between those two quantities. Now, equations, kinematic equations. We have this equation replaced by omegas and alphas instead of V and A. Here is another one. And then a third one. So, if you know the equations in linear motion, you can pretty much get the equations in rotational motion. Another important quantity in rotational motion is torque. Torque is represented by tau, that's the Greek symbol, called tau, which stands for torque. And torque is actually the rotating effect of a force. As you can see, here is an object supported on a horizontal frictionless table and there is a cord attached to that object and the other end of the cord is tied to a pivot at that point and it's uh, moving around in a circle or it is rotating so the torque in this case is the product of the distance r the force F, so the distance R, the force F, and the sine of the angle between the distance and the force. In this diagram, that angle is 90 degrees, as you can see. So torque is R F sine theta. Practically, it's R F sine theta. But if theta is 90, then sine 90 is 1, and then the torque becomes maximum. So torque, again, is the product of the distance, the force, and the sine of the angle between the distance and the force. Now is the time to compare two important equations. In linear motion, we have this all-important equation that the net force is mass times acceleration. The corresponding equation in rotational motion is that the net torque is I times alpha. Now, I is called rotational inertia. It's also called moment of inertia and takes the place of mass in linear motion. So wherever we have mass appearing in linear motion, we're going to have rotational inertia in rotational motion. So I is rotational inertia. So here's the diagram. So if you have a particle of mass m uh, making a circular path of radius r, then the rotational inertia is simply mr squared. So rotational inertia is the product of mass 
and square of the distance of that mass from the axis of rotation. That's only for a particle, it's mr squared, and the unit is kilogram meter squared. Here there are many rotational inertias given for particular geometric shapes. You need not know all of them. You need to know the rotational inertia of a disk, which is mr squared by 2. For a solid sphere, it's a 2 by 5 mr squared. For a, a rod, it is ml squared by 12. Now remember that the rotational inertia depends on the axis of rotation. And in all these cases, the axis passes right through the center, whether it be the disk or the road. In all these cases, the axis of rotation passes through the center of gravity. Now is the time to look at kinetic energy. Hope you remember the formula for kinetic energy in linear motion. In linear motion, kinetic energy is one half times mass times velocity squared, right? Now that is called trans translational kinetic energy. And do remember that mass is always replaced with rotational inertia. So rotational kinetic energy is one half times I omega square because in place of linear velocity you have angular velocity that's easy to remember now the diagram shows that while the grindstone is rotating the the light the heat it's flying off the sparks in fact is flying off tangentially so that's linear motion while there is rotation here so you have both these types of energies shown there. You have translational kinetic energy and you have rotational kinetic energy. This angular momentum. Remember that linear momentum P is mass times velocity. So angular momentum is going to be I times omega. Because in place of mass, you always have rotational inertia. In place of linear velocity, you have angular velocity. Angular momentum has pretty big units. You've got to put the unit of I, which is kilogram meter squared, and then omega is radians per second. We also have this relation for force in linear motion. It's change in linear momentum by time. Therefore, in rotational motion, torque is going to be change in angular momentum by time. So torque takes the place of force and angular momentum takes the place of linear momentum. I hope by now you see the connection between linear and rotational motion. And just like uh, we studied the conservation of linear momentum, we have conservation of angular momentum. And well illustrated by this ice skater, if her hands and feet are spread out, then her rotational inertia is bigger because there is mass distributed away from the axis of rotation. But when she brings her hands together and pulls her feet together, her total rotational inertia is now smaller. And as a consequence, she starts spinning faster which can be explained because angular momentum is I times omega, isn't it? And so when I decreases, in this case, omega increases to omega prime. So according to the conservation of angular momentum, I omega initial is I omega final, which means if I decreases, omega increases. Or if I, maybe, increases in some other case, then omega decreases. That's the conservation of angular momentum. 
Next, let us look at the direction of angular velocity and angular momentum. If you look at this disk, and uh, you can see that it's rotating in the clockwise, oh, sorry, counterclockwise direction. And if you hold the your right hand with the fingers curved in the direction of rotation, the thumb will give you the direction of angular velocity and angular momentum. So that's how we find the direction of omega and L. Remember to use the right hand always and the curved fingers to the tips show the direction of rotation. In which case the thumb will give the direction of angular velocity and angular momentum. Which means if the disc was rotating in the clockwise direction, you got to flip your right hand down and you will see the thumb is now going to point down. Let me ask you this. What would be the direction of angular momentum for a bicycle that's um, going towards the north? So the bicycle is going to the north. If you hold your right hand with the uh, fingers rotating in the direction of the spinning wheels of the bicycle, then you will surely see that the thumb is pointing to the west or to the left of the rider. I hope that's clear. So the angular momentum for a bicycle going north is towards the west. And uh, speaking about the bicycle, you can also see that the construction of the wheels or the design itself is in such a way as to reduce the rotational inertia. That's why we use these, you know, spokes here. We're trying to have the wheels have a smaller rotational inertia. Otherwise, it would be incredibly tough to start moving the bicycle. But at the same time, once you keep, uh, once you move it, you can stop pedaling once in a while and the bicycle will continue moving because you find that the, the mass now is concentrated at the edges. So that's a small rotational inertia, but at the same time, the mass is concentrated at the, at the edges to keep it rolling. Once again, this is uh, another example for conservation of angular momentum. Uh, the diver spins rapidly when curled up because the rotational inertia becomes small as she tucks herself in and therefore the angular velocity increases. But when she extends her limbs uh, just before hitting the water, she slows down. And obviously she must. So that's again a, another example of conservation of angular momentum. And I think that's it. These are the, the most important uh, quantities and equations in this chapter. But that being said, now you need to look at the problem set and see how the problems are worked out. And that's when you understand how these equations are, have been applied to solve those problems. This will then help you to do the homework, which is kind of the same. Take the quiz and get ready for the exam. Wish you all the best. Thank you.